Do you ever wonder how lawyers expose liars in court? If you are facing a criminal case or maybe a restraining order and the other side is lying about you, you may be wondering, how is my attorney going to try to bring that out at trial? And in this video, I'm going to be going through seven different ways that attorneys expose liars in court. My name is Veronica. I am a criminal defense and domestic violence restraining order defense attorney here in California. And I help people put their cases behind them so that they can enjoy their lives and their freedom. Now, if you're watching this video, you're probably watching it for one of two reasons. One may be that you have a criminal case. If you do have one in California, you can get a free consultation with me down below. The other reason might be that you are facing a domestic violence restraining order. If you are and you're considering representing yourself, I teach a course on exactly how to do that. How to win your restraining order hearing on your own without an attorney and you can get your first free class for that down below. Okay, so let's to jump right into it, the seven different ways that lawyers expose liars in court. Number one, the biased witness. The biased witness is a witness who has a dog in the fight, so to speak. A witness who has a reason for wanting a particular outcome in the case. So in the case of a restraining order, the petitioner or the respondent, either party, has a dog in the fight, right? It's your case. You, If you're asking for the restraining order, you want a restraining order. If you are asking for the restraining order to be dropped, that's the result that you want. And so you have a bias, you have a reason to lie. In a criminal case, if the defendant, for example, testifies, he has a bias, right? He doesn't want to be convicted, that's only natural. So those are some very clear examples of bias, but Many times it's not that clear. So one example would be, and this is actually from a real case I had that I won at trial, where the detective had been investigating my client for murders in a nearby park. My client was a gang member and I don't know if he was guilty of those murders, but in my case he was charged with attempted murder. And this detective had been trying to get him, trying to get him. And so when this attempted murder case came up and my client, who acted in self-defense as the jury ultimately agreed, he was like, aha! Ah, this guy, I'm going to charge him, I'm going to get him, and I want him to be convicted. So, in that case, amongst the many questions that I asked him about what a failure his investigation was and all the steps that he didn't take that he should have taken, some of the questions that I asked him were, isn't it true that you have investigated my client for other crimes and never been able to even get an arrest on them? Isn't it true that you already knew who my client was before this file landed on your desk? Could it be that you are harboring some professional resentment toward my client due to your past unsuccessful investigations? Isn't it possible that you are seeking to bolster your own professional reputation here by trying to get my client convicted? You see how that works? It's really important to ask those questions when there is a bias or a potential bias. And part of our jobs as attorneys and part of your job if you're going to represent yourself in your own case is to really think about you know, if I think that this witness is lying or exaggerating, what would their reasons be for doing that? And then bring those reasons out if I possibly can. Number two, the mistaken witness. Now this comes up a lot when we're talking about identifications. If you've ever seen a TV show where there's like a lineup of suspects in a police station, or more commonly they do photo lineups, they call them six packs, where they have six different photographs and a witness who has to pick out who they saw committing a crime. In the context of a restraining order, this could be a neighbor who maybe called the police for domestic violence. This could even be a police officer if there's a custody exchange at a police station where the police officer isn't really trying to get you prosecuted, but he may be wrong about what he saw. One example of this would be where a witness claims to have seen the defendant leaving the scene of a crime, but the crime happened at night with poor lighting some questions that a lawyer might ask in this scenario would be, this happened at about midnight. It was dark. This took place in an alley. There weren't any street lights in the alley. You were 30 feet away. You identified him by wearing a black hoodie. You didn't describe his face. And then depending on the witness, the lawyer could say, isn't it possible that you misidentified my client. Now that can be risky because it gives a witness an opportunity to say, no, I am absolutely 100% sure that it was your client. And of course that's not helping you if you're the defendant, right? The way to eliminate that risk would be instead of making that conclusion, isn't it possible you got the ID wrong, you would wait and you would make a note of that and in your closing argument, you would bring that up and you would say, remember how the witness admitted 
that she was 30 feet away, that it was dark, it was midnight, this was in an alley, there were no street lights, and this is the only piece of evidence against my client. How can we possibly believe her identification? We can't convict him based on this. You argue that there is reasonable doubt because there's doubt as to the identification. Number three, the lying witness. So this comes up quite a bit in domestic violence restraining order hearings. If one party is saying that there was abuse, the other party is saying that there wasn't, somebody is lying, right? And this comes up in the context of criminal defense too. As you may be realizing as we go through these, for some witnesses, multiple are going to apply. Bias and lying could both apply, for example. So one example of this would be a jailhouse informant. The witness is a jailhouse informant who claims that the defendant confessed to the crime when they were in a cell together. The defendant says that this conversation never happened. So what types of questions would the lawyer ask to expose this lie and this bias? Isn't it true that you are currently incarcerated in the men's central jail awaiting trial for robbery? Isn't it true that you are facing nine years in state prison? You don't want to go to prison, do you, sir? You probably do almost anything to try to avoid prison. And prior to being housed in a cell with my client, you didn't know him, right? He's not your friend. He's not your family member. You don't care about him. And I bet when you told the guards at the jail that my client had confessed to you, they were probably pretty happy, right? When you told your own defense attorney that you'd gotten this confession from my client, he was probably pretty happy, right? And when you sat in a room with the prosecutor, with the detective, and with your defense attorney, they were all probably pretty happy with you. They haven't given you an offer of a reduced sentence yet in your robbery case, right? They wanted to wait and see how you testified here today, right? You see how that calls the jailhouse informant's testimony into question? It paints the picture of this desperate man who wants to get out of jail, of course. And one tricky thing that the prosecution sometimes will do is if they are going to make an offer of a reduced sentence in exchange for testimony in a different case, they don't want to make that offer before trial. There are two reasons. They don't want me as a defense attorney to be able to say, isn't it true that you were facing nine years in state prison and you got time served? And that was in exchange for testifying against my client. They don't want me to be able to say that. But they also want to secure his testimony. They're not crazy. They're not going to let this guy out, let him go back to whatever it is he was doing before he was in jail, and then potentially not have their star witness. So we want to make sure that the jury understands what's really going on here as much as possible through our questions. Number four, the implausible witness. The implausible witness is spinning a tale that simply doesn't make sense with reality. Sometimes it's because there isn't evidence that you would expect to exist if their story was true. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense with human nature or physics or human senses. So let me give you an example that frequently comes up in restraining order cases and criminal cases. Let's say that the witness is accusing the defendant of punching him three times in the face, on the cheek. You'd expect that to cause a bruise, right? But he doesn't have any photos of the bruise. He also says that this took place on a busy street with a bunch of people around, but there are no other witnesses, nobody called 911, nobody did anything. There's in fact no talk of any other witnesses or reactions of anybody being there. It really doesn't make sense, right? If you picture it in your mind's eye, do you really believe that that happened? So questions that an attorney might ask are, you don't have any photos of your injuries. And you said that this occurred during broad daylight, right? And this was on a busy street. There were people everywhere, but none of them called 911. None of them are here today to testify. And in your testimony, you didn't describe any reactions of any of the other people. Nobody jumped in to try to stop him, did they? Look, jurors and judges both spend the entire day hearing testimony, hearing facts, and it's easy to sort of zone out. So it's important to point these things out, to serve all of this to the judge or to the jury on a silver platter so that they start to think in their mind, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. If this was the middle of a day on a busy street, nobody, nobody called 911? This person was punched three times in the face, but I mean, we don't even have photos of a red mark, nothing? And they'll start to doubt the witness. Number five, the forgetful witness. This comes up when a witness claims to remember some things about an incident, but not others. And basically the only things that they remember are things that were written down somewhere. This can come up where a witness testifies as to 
what is in a police report, but they don't actually seem to have any independent recollection of what happened. So they basically only know what is in the police report and they claim to know nothing else. So, I mean, what's going on in this situation? They actually don't remember what happened. Maybe it's been way too long, but they probably looked at a copy of the police report and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, so that's what I said that back then, I'll just say the same thing now. One of the big problems with that, especially when it's not a police officer testifying, it's somebody else, is the police officers often don't get it exactly right in the police report. And even what they do get right, maybe missing some key details. So if an attorney notices this going on, then we'll ask them for basic information that they probably would have if they had an independent recollection of the events. One example of this in the context of a criminal case could be a cashier who's testifying about an armed robbery. And in the police report, the cashier describes the robber's face, describes what he was wearing, but it doesn't say anything in there either way about whether the robber said anything to the cashier. It also says that the robber had a gun, but doesn't describe the gun at all. Doesn't describe the color of it, how he was holding it. So the defense attorney should be listening closely when the witness initially testifies and then start asking the questions that are not in the police report and that were not just testified to. You say that the robber had a gun. What color was the gun? How was the robber holding the gun? Did the robber say anything to you? And when the witness keeps saying, I don't know, I don't remember, then the attorney might ask, isn't it true that you reviewed a copy of the police report today? And that contained some of your initial statements to the police. And it said, for example, that the robber was holding a gun, but it didn't say what color. And it didn't say how he was holding it. Now, when you initially reported this, you probably remembered something about what the gun looked like. You probably remembered which hand the robber was holding the gun in but that wasn't in the police report and you don't remember today. What you're trying to do here is establish that they have no independent recollection of what actually occurred and they're simply regurgitating what's in the police report. So their testimony is only as reliable as the police report itself. And the police report may have been written days later. It's the police officer paraphrasing and often the police reports even say, hey, I'm just paraphrasing what the witness told me. So there could be some major inaccuracies there. Number six, the misleading witness. This occurs where the witness claims to remember some things very, very clearly, but doesn't remember or won't commit to some other details. This comes up very frequently in domestic violence restraining order hearings and domestic violence criminal cases where the victim, the witness, is afraid that if they commit to, for example, a time of day or whether or not they worked that day that they will be able to be impeached. Like basically there will be evidence showing that they're lying. So they don't want to commit to it. So for example, let's say in a domestic violence case, the petitioner claims that the respondent or the, the defendant hit her, we'll just say again, in the face and grabs her arm causing a bruise, but doesn't give a specific date. The attorney is going to want to try to nail her down to a specific date. If there's, for example, social media photographs of her or text messages that would make her story not make sense. And the witness, depending on how smart they are, they may start to realize, oh shoot, the day that I'm saying, the day that I was going to say that this happened, I think maybe I posted on Instagram that day or was it TikTok, you know. I don't want to get caught in a lie, so I'll just say I don't remember. I don't remember what day any of this happened on. So in that example, some questions that the attorney might ask are, you're saying that he hit you in the face, correct? You're saying that he grabbed you on the arm. You had really bad bruises. You didn't take any photos of any of those. You don't remember what day it was on. Do you remember what week it was in? Do you remember what month it was in? She's saying no, she doesn't remember, right? And at that point, depending on the evidence that the attorney has, they might want to bring up, okay, well, according to your Instagram, you were on a girl's trip for the week of June 20th. You went to the beach. We have the photos from that, and I don't see any bruises, do you? And, you know, sort of go through, with, depending on how complete their evidence is as to when it could have possibly happened. But we want to make their story sound preposterous. Like, I can see not knowing the day, but you should be able to go back and figure out the week, especially if you're bringing proceedings against somebody in court saying that they abused you.
if there are no medical records or no photos of the injuries, we're just supposed to take this person's word for it, but they can't even tell us the day, how much can we really believe them? Number seven, the angry witness. So this also comes up quite a bit in domestic violence cases, whether it's criminal or restraining orders. And basically what happens is that if a witness, and this includes you if you are the defendant or the respondent, gets angry in court and shows that anger in front of the judge or in front of the jury, then most likely they have lost the case. Now the good news for you if you are the respondent or the defendant is that depending on the circumstances and depending on what the defense is, this can be used very effectively against the other party, against the witness. So if you are the witness, Make sure that you do not express anger at any point, especially if you're accused of being violent. That is one way to immediately lose your hearing. Just don't do it. And I'll use as an example of this a domestic violence felony trial that I had. I was defending a man and our defense was self-defense. She attacked him and he used force on her, but only to defend himself. That's a tall order, but I always believed my client. And I felt confident from his description of her, from my observations of her that I could probably make her angry, and I did. The way that I did that, and there were multiple techniques that I used, and we won this trial, by the way. The way that I got her angry is this is somebody who seemed like she really had really high self-esteem and sort of like, hey, you're not rejecting me, I'm rejecting you, that kind of attitude, if that makes sense. And she had previously said that she broke up with my client and she made a big deal of that at a prior hearing, even though it wasn't really that important or that relevant. So some questions that I asked her were, Mr. We'll call him Doe. Mr. Doe expressed unhappiness with you in the relationship, correct? He believed that you should get a job. He was disappointed when you dropped out of school. He expressed doubt that you were ever going to be a famous Instagram model. And ultimately, he expressed that he was just not satisfied with the relationship and he wanted to end it. He broke up with you, right? Now, as I'm saying all this stuff completely innocently, she's getting pissed. And it ultimately ended with her raising her voice to me, insisting that she had broken up with him, and then me pulling out the text messages where he broke up with her. And granted, I think that they probably broke up with each other multiple times, but showing this to her, making her look like a liar. And at that point, maybe she could have explained if she'd been calm that they went back and forth and the occasion that she's talking about is when she'd broken up with him. Maybe she could have done that, but she wasn't calm enough to do it. She lost her cool, she lost the case, and my client went free. I hope you found this video helpful. Again, if you are looking for help with a criminal case in California, feel free to give me a call. You can find my number down below. You can also find a link there to book a consultation with me. And if you are facing a domestic violence restraining order and you're thinking about representing yourself, go ahead and click the link in the description box to get your free first class in my course, Defeat the DVRO. So you can check it out. You have nothing to lose. You're going to find more there than you're going to find binge watching YouTube. And if you did find this video helpful, please don't forget to subscribe, like, and ring the bell.